I'm here today with photographer and author David Dushiman. David created Craft and Vision in 2008 as a way to get his books and other resources into the hands of photographers to help them learn the craft with greater focus and depth while avoiding all the noise and gimmicks so prevalent in popular photography. An impassioned champion of the amateur, his focus is on the importance of vision, craft, and creativity. He wants to teach, encourage, and inspire you. Now, you may be surprised that I'm interviewing a photographer, but David's approach to marketing is something I would like all authors to hear. It's very similar to a lot of the things that I talk about in the uh, Business of Being a Spiritual Writer class. Um, but you can learn more about David and his work at craftandvision.com and at theaudienceacademy.com, where you can also subscribe to his excellent email newsletter. So, David, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Brian. It's good to see you again. Yes. So um, before we kind of get into marketing and things, maybe you can just give us a little bit more about your background than what I was able to touch on there. Yeah. I mean, we could spend we could spend the whole uh, podcast just talking about my background, but um, I, briefly, it's been very zigzaggy. I did a five-year uh, degree in theology on the cold Canadian prairies before, uh, before graduating and to the shock of my alma mater going into a career in stand-up comedy. And I spent 12 years doing comedy shows across Canada and the U.S. Uh, until one day it just felt like it wasn't, um, it wasn't my thing anymore. And uh, I made a wild transition into humanitarian photography, spent years doing that. And when I transitioned in, back into photography, which was a creative love of mine for years, uh, I knew that a part of what I wanted to do was teach and I began to teach and eventually started writing to photographers and now um, would say primarily my job is as a photography writer. I'm still doing a lot of photography, um, focusing on humanitarian things as well as conservation issues, photographing bears and whales and that kind of thing. Um, but I spend much of my time writing to photographers and actually increasingly to creatives of all stripes, people that are photographers, visual artists, uh, designers, um, writers, and uh, speaking to issues of creativity. But also, I think, speaking to issues, uh, as you pointed out, you know, the, the marketing stuff, because what I've encountered is this big block with creative people that you know they pour their heart and their soul into their creativity and their art and yet when it comes to getting that creativity and art into the world it is uh it's uh, a challenge i think at best um at worst it's looked on as sort of this uh there's sort of an incongruity people love to make their art but there's something blocking them from putting it into the world. And it's, it's almost considered dirty to engage in, you know, so-called marketing or so-called self-promotion. And I, I think that's a shame. I think it's a big missed opportunity. And I think if creative people could bring their art into the world, bring it into the market um, with the same creativity and enthusiasm and passion and soul and integrity, that they make their art, I think those efforts would be would be much greater. I think creative people that that felt like they could, you know, market themselves and not need to go take a shower afterwards would do it just so much better. It'd be so much more effective, and they feel better about it. I mean, we don't tend to do things we don't feel good about, right? If we don't find a way to enjoy going to the gym, we just won't do it. And if you don't like marketing if you don't like talking about yourself if you can't find a way to rewrite the script on that you're going to find it really hard to engage in it and i just i rebel against this idea of the starving artist i think if you're making something that contributes something of value to the world you should be rewarded for it you should at least be able to make a living at it if not a beautiful living at it and you should be able to uh make more of what you do i mean it's really hard to make more art when you're spending all your energy trying to pay the bills and scrape together rent. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And um, we'll, we'll talk more about the whole marketing aspect of things um, here in a moment. But um, tell us a little bit about the different books that you have written. Well, I, I, you know, <laughs> I never intended to be a writer. Um, 
I, uh, I was approached by a publishing company years ago that wanted me to do a, a book about travel photography. And I, I re- just wasn't really interested. They wanted me to write one book of a series of kind of pretty generic books. Um, but it got me thinking. I, I started thinking, you know, if I could write the book that I want to write, what would that look like? So I declined that particular opportunity, but it opened a huge door in my thinking. Uh, so in 2009, I wrote a book called Within the Frame, The Journey of Photographic Vision. And uh, much to my shock, it actually became, you know, in the photography world, became a bestseller. And uh, it's now in its, gosh, I don't know how many printings, but it's on its third edition, which just, what, a couple of years ago released a, a 10th anniversary edition. And after that, it's sort of one thing led to another. And I remember writing my third book about photography and thinking, well, that's definitely it. I mean, I can't think of anything else I would write about photography. And uh, now I I think I'm up to something like 12 traditionally published books through a couple of different um, sort of mainstream publishers. And then somewhere in there, I started writing eBooks, smaller digital books that I could sell online, uh, keep all of the income from and you know for which there was no there's no overhead to sell an ebook you don't have to warehouse a pdf and it costs you the same to sell to one as it, as to a million people and uh and so i ended up creating my own publishing company not intentionally it kind of one day i woke up and realized i kind of had and uh now craft and vision is um it's a thriving little tiny publishing house that is responsible for publishing my my uh, electronic books as well as uh, going to press with some fine art coffee table books that uh, sort of feature my art in limited edition ones. So an accidental author and an accidental publishing house. You, you know, story of my life, man. <laughs> Everything is, and it's funny because I talk a lot about being really intentional about things, but it's usually in my case, it's intentional after I have accidentally you know, found myself in a situation. I think, hey, this this is a. I was really brilliant to have totally stumbled stumbled into this. <laughs> well, even you know, if I remember correctly, the whole humanitarian photography thing was kind of semi accidental, right? I mean, uh, no, it was completely accidental. I mean, I was I was intending to go to Haiti uh, on a completely unrelated matter as a comedian. And uh, at the last minute, they said, "Could you bring your cameras?" They found out that I was a photographer, and I said, "Absolutely." And I got there and that's when I was already feeling some discomfort with the comedy and feeling a need for change. And I got to Haiti with my cameras and I went, this is what I want to do. And I went home and told everyone, I'm going to be a humanitarian photographer. And they said, what's that? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. And uh, they said, well, can you make money at that? I said, I don't know that either, but we're going to make it happen. So, you know, it's, uh, I think a a lot of life is a, a handshake between the the accidental and the serendipitous and, you know, reaching out and grabbing that opportunity and making it your own. Yeah, no, I totally agree. We call it accidental, but, you know, at the same time, it's, it's, it's basically recognizing opportunities that you didn't know were there. Sure. And yeah. having your eyes open and yeah. yeah and jumping on them when you see something that fits and works. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, oh, and sometimes you don't know it works, right. But it's, yeah. it's, it stirs something in you. And lights a spark that's strong enough that you think, you know what, I don't, I don't even know if this is going to work, but I got to try. I got to see if I can make. And that's the, the beautiful thing about the creative life is it's, it's all a series of what ifs. And uh, um, I used to do a lot of uh, four by fouring in my Jeep. And, you know, we'd always sort of when we wanted to try something a little sketchy, we sort of say, you know, hang on a sec. I want to try something. And I feel like, you know, that that's when everyone puts their seatbelts on. And, um, that's that's the creative life. It's hang on a sec. I want to try something. And, you know, sometimes it works. And other times you discover, OK, well, I, I, I can't do that thing. <laughs> well, you know, you view a lot of this very entrepreneurially. And, you know, sure. for me as an entrepreneur, everything's an experiment. Right. I mean, right. You, if, you, if you're not failing at some things, then you're not trying enough things. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, where do we learn, right? We learn through our failures. That failure is our most faithful teacher. And if, yeah, as you say, if you're not actually, if you're not risking, that's, that's the secret to the creative life. I think it's just risking and testing and experimenting and uh, nothing is a failure because the things that don't work the way you thought they do, well, maybe it's just a first iteration, maybe it's a prototype. And, and if you sort of dust your knees off and say, okay, well, that, 
you know, that didn't work. I'm never trying that again. You walk away from, you've already paid the price for that lesson. You may as well internalize it and build on it. And, um, you know, rather than kind of look, you know, we, we fall down and then first thing we do is we look around and make sure nobody noticed. Um, I, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, you trip on the street, why not just throw your hands in the air and say, Hey, did, did you see that recovery? I mean, that was fantastic. <laughs> but it's, all, it's all perspective, right? So I first learned about David's work through one of his blog articles that was forwarded to me by someone who had attended one of my classes. And she was struck um, as I was at how similar his, David's approach and my approach to marketing are. And um, the title of the blog article was where is the gift? And so David, I'd love for you to kind of explain, you know, what that thinking was all about. Yeah, I, um, <laughs> um, I have this notion that uh, going back to what I said about, you know, creative people disdaining the idea of marketing, it, it feels like, I mean, creativity is a gift. Creativity, when we make art, we put that art into the world. It is a gift. It's a contribution. And, and yet self-promotion, so-called self-promotion, so-called marketing feels like rather than a giving, an act of giving to a lot of people, especially the creative people and artists who are maybe more sensitive to this kind of stuff. Um, it feels like an act of taking it. It's the, the copy that we write to try to promote our books or our artwork feels self aggrandizing. It feels like it's all bye, bye, bye. And, and so people resist that and rightfully so. I, I think, you know, life is, is in giving, not in taking, um, though it's also in receiving. So I want to separate taking from receiving. But if we could, in everything that we do, in speaking about our art and speaking about the benefit of that art, whatever it is, whether it's a print on a wall or, or your book or uh, your design, whatever your, your thing is, if, if we could put that, not just the gift into the world, uh, you know, your art into the world as a gift, but if in our marketing, in the emails that we write, in our website, in everything that we do that is outbound into the world, if we asked ourselves before we hit send, what's the gift? What am I giving to my audience? I think our perspective on marketing would change considerably. I think we would be much more relaxed about it. We'd feel better about it. And frankly, it would be more effective because it would be uh, the putting of something valuable into the world that people could use. Even in my emails, if, if it's not a, hey, buy my latest book kind of email, which by the way, I have no problem writing. I have no problem putting my book out and saying, I would love it if you bought my book. And the reason is I believe in that book. I believe that there's value there. It too is a gift. It's just, in this case, it's a gift. They're going to have to, you know, pay $20 to, to, uh, own but it's a gift if i didn't if i didn't believe it was a gift if i didn't believe that it was in fact worth much more than twenty dollars i don't believe i have any business putting it into the world i you know i don't like asymmetries i, I don't like taking more or receiving more than i give and and so i want to put a uh, a book that's worth a hundred dollars into the world and say and you know to my audience if you want this thing, it's, it's only $20. But to me, it's all about putting the putting of value into the world. And even if it's an email that's not actively trying to um, uh, put one of my books into my audience's hands, I still want to be giving, I want to be taking ideas, for example, from that book and selling the idea in the sense that, you know, that one's free, but it's a gift. There's, they're going to walk away with some wisdom they're going to walk away with some, maybe just some laughter. I tell a story and they laugh and they think, oh, that's really great. And there's a metaphor in there and they learn a thing or whatever. But if you can, whatever you put into the world in, in terms of your marketing, if it's a gift, your audience uh, begins to pick up on that. They begin to say things to you like every time one of your emails comes in, I stop what I'm doing and I read it because of the way it makes me feel because of the thing that I'm going to learn, because I, and I have people tell me I've got five, 
um, like inboxes, ma mailboxes, just with my name on it, that they file and keep my my emails. They tell me that they've been reading my email for over 10 years and mine is the only email that they haven't unsubscribed from. Um, and I don't say that to, to toot my own horn. I just think if people are saying that to you, it tells you that your marketing is an act of giving, not an act of taking. And so people keep keep opening my emails. And on those occasions where I have a book or a course or you know a new print to offer them. I don't look at it as selling. I look at it as an invitation. They've already told me they love what I do. Now I'm saying, here's an invitation to go a little deeper. Here's an invitation to have more of an exchange of value. And it's, it's reciprocal and it's, uh, it's more relational than anything. So that question, <laughs> to come all the way back to your initial question, that question, where, what is the gift? is a guiding principle for me that keeps me on track. Because if I, if I know that when I put something into the world, it does contain a gift or is a gift in itself, I feel great about my marketing. I feel like it's, it's on my calendar. I write my emails regularly. I send them regularly. And it's not separate from my creative life, Brian. It is part of my creative life. Those emails are there's heart and soul in that stuff and like that's a very key mindset it's oh it's so key and if there's not heart and soul in it if i am asking myself what's the gift and i can honestly not answer that question i don't send it i go back to the drawing board i delete it and i start over i think okay i i, I started with a message and it, it derailed into some you know some horrible sales pitch and i rewrite it so that it is a gift and then if I'm trying to promote a book or something, I don't look at it as, okay, now I've got a sales pitch. It's a gift that also has an invitation to them. And then I can answer the question, what's the gift? I can clearly look at that and say, okay, there's something in it for them, even if they don't buy the course, they don't buy the book. And it feels good. It feels really good to be released from this I'm not self-promoting. promoting. I'm not promoting myself. I'm promoting ideas. I'm promoting uh, change. Uh, and a lot of, you know, anyone that's um, writing, uh, you know, books that are positive, books that are um, related to spirituality, one of the, the ideas that you're promoting is you, you can experience hope. You can experience, you know, change in your relationships. or You don't have to promote yourself to promote an idea to promote change, to promote the thing, the reason for which you wrote that book in the first place, which we all know can't be the, you know, the fame and the fortune, because that's, just, that's, that's, if you're writing books for fame and fortune, you pick the wrong industry. Exactly, exactly. Another word that I use with um, trying to describe what you're doing, particularly with your periodic emails, is nourishment. You know, mm -hmm. think of Absolutely. How, how are you nourishing your audience, you know, with something that's, you know, of substance, of a value, of, of uh, you know, not necessarily um, biological uh, nourishment, but, but sure. mental nourishment. <laughs> and that, that idea, you use that word, and I often talk about, you know, sort of the care and feeding of my audience. Um, but in our last conversation, you used the word nourishment. And I, I, I've, that has stuck with me because it's not just feeding them. It's nourishment is feeding them the good stuff. It's the stuff from which they can grow. It's the, the thing physically, you know, that we actually, our bodies need. And I think if we can fill our emails and whatever, whatever it is that you do, your social posts, your YouTube videos, all of that stuff, if you can fill some, if you can fill that with something nourishing that they can take away and will help them, they will, they will want more of that. And sometimes that will be in the form of something for which they exchange value for value. And they, you know, creative people are really weird about talking about money, but let's face it, we need the money to keep making the things that we're making. And anything that any creative person has ever sold me, I've never looked at the exchange and gone, ah, oh, I can't believe they asked for money. I'm thrilled to put down $20 to get that new book. I mean, I, I'm like addicted to the Amazon buy now button. I just, you know, someone tells me about a book. I'm like, hang on. I don't even write a note. I just pull up Amazon and I, and I'm thrilled to be able to give that, 
well, in the case of the writer, you know, what do they get a, a buck or two out of the deal? But, you know, after a few of those, they can buy a, a whole cup of coffee. But it does feel, it feels good to, I got this thing that I'm thrilled about that someone took time and put their heart and soul in it. There's nothing wrong with, I mean, commerce, we are fundamentally commercial trading, exchanging beings. We like that. And I think we can do it well. I think we can do it with integrity and beauty and in such a way that everyone gains in some way, that everyone walks away from it, you know, with that nourishment of some kind. Well, money, you know, it's just a way of exchanging value, right? You know, uh, it, it doesn't have to be an obsession. It doesn't have to be, you know, Not at all. used. <laughs> no, it's, you know, I mean, we run into trouble when it becomes about greed and avarice. And, but the, the coins themselves, hey, if we, you know, if, if, our, um, if we were still trading with cowrie shells or, you know, some other thing, you know, jelly beans, we, we wouldn't be that weird about talking about it. But somewhere along the way, we, we stopped talking about it. And, and it's, I think it's a shame because I think creative people too, because we don't talk about money, they're, they're not maybe planning well for their future. They haven't talked to people about, you know, sound financial. I mean, I was a financial moron, Brian. I mean, I went, I went bankrupt in my, well, I guess it was my late twenties, early thirties. Um, because I, we just didn't talk about that stuff. And, uh, I think that's, you know, that's a whole other conversation, but we all of this can be done beautifully and all be done with integrity and and i think that's the, the uh, if you can have that mindset everything changes so um as you know i primarily focus on authors that write spiritual nonfiction. right uh, that's not exclusively um there's other areas that you know i work with authors too but that's the largest and so there are two things that i try to <clears throat> instill in them in terms of concepts to help shift their mindset away from the concern about self-promotion, things like that. One of them is similar to what, you know, you're, you've been describing in terms of a gift and the other one's less similar. So I, I'd love your reactions to these and then also see if you have other tools, so to speak, besides, you know, looking at the gift or the nourishment aspect of things. Sure. So, so the one thing that I try to help people understand is that most likely the reason why you're writing your book in the first place is because you're trying to help someone. Right. Absolutely. And help help has a lot of different, you know, forms, right? It could literally be self-help or, or but it could be entertainment, it could be education, it could be humor, I mean a variety of things. But at the end of the day, why are you writing the book if it's not to help someone, you know, in one of those different kinds of ways? So marketing is just letting people know how you can help them. Absolutely. <laughs> right? It's creating awareness around how you can help them. So what's wrong with that? Right. So yep. So that's one kind of you know avenue that I, I, I pursue. Now the other part one is is because you know I deal mostly with Christian and, and, and religious authors, and a lot of folks believe that God is working through them to create mm -hmm. their book. Mm -hmm. And you know, so another way to look at this is like, okay, who are you to stand in the way of <laughs> God working through you? Right. It's not sure. just creating the book. It's also building the awareness and doing the other things so people can find out about the book and find out about, you know, how God has used you as a conduit. Right. And, so, and if that's the if that's the case, then it becomes an issue of stewardship. Exactly. And to, exactly. to not to not put your ideas out there, to not market or I mean, take the word just to not communicate <clears throat> is uh, I think is a failure of stewardship. I, I think it's it's lazy and you know we we come up with all these other you know uh, you know i just don't want to put myself out and it's false modesty but false modesty to be honest is just the flip side of pride and and a non-recognition of this is why you're here this is what you've been called to this is the task ahead of you now get to work and you know get up on the ramparts and and yell it out if you want to help save families if you want to help you know, men be better husbands or, you know, whatever your calling is, uh, boy, it, it sure better be more than just writing it in a book and then being quiet about it. As far as I'm concerned, that's putting your light under a bushel. Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you use the word stewardship. Um, one of the other, you know, marketing folks that I really respect talks about being a good steward of your audience, right? You know, you've been blessed with a large audience, right? You know, so... Yeah. You know, I, I know I feel some obligation to that audience, 
that we, we must we must feel that obligation brian because we talk all the time about you know stewardship and, and responsibility with money but uh, our audience pays attention to us it is a resource a very limited resource they give us their attention and their time and to poorly steward that i think is i mean you know from a, a spiritual perspective is truly irresponsible but i think it's pragmatically it's also a, a, an incredible missed opportunity. Yes. People are actively listening and to be silent on the other end of the microphone is, um, I think is irresponsible. To totally agree. Totally agree. So I guess one thing I should ask you is what do you have planned going forward? Is there anything you can talk about in terms of new books or particularly if they're around marketing, it'd be wonderful to <laughs> yeah, talk about I, that. I, 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 you know, I, I, I haven't written a book about this stuff. I wrote it years ago. I wrote a book called vision mongers. Uh, making a life and a living um, in photography. And it was specific to photographers. Um, I do have, um, I have written some other things about that topic. Um, but the, the big thing that I've just done is built a course called Standing Room Only. And uh, it's not, it's not open immediately right now. We've just finished enrollment. So we're, all the students are hardworking on, you know, on this stuff, but it, it's a course, it's a 12 module course about uh, for creative people about building and nurturing an audience and specifically doing that through email. You know, we haven't really talked uh, pragmatically about like, how do we do this stuff? But these days, everyone's jumping onto social media um, or has been on social media for ages. And, uh, and the problem with social media is, well, <laughs> I mean, don't get me started. There's many so many problems social with social media. Um, but but one of the bigger problems is that it just doesn't have the reach that it once did. And it doesn't have the engagement. You know, when people are reading a post on Facebook or Instagram, for example, it's one post among many on a scroll. So you haven't even really got their full attention. Uh, and these days, Facebook and Instagram, uh, they're saying that if you get three to 7% of your followers actually seeing the content you post, that's an average. Well, three to 7%, uh, that's not, to me, that's not worth the time. I can get on average 30 to 50% open rates on an email and they're reading it in a way in, you know, in their inbox, it's much more intimate, it's personal, they're giving it their full attention. Um, so the, to go back to the, the course that I'm doing, and really it's more about the mindset. It's the, this idea that whatever you choose to do in terms of your marketing the best way to approach it, the most productive way that I found most efficient is to get that audience, whatever the other platforms are, get them onto a platform of your own, get them increasingly into more and more intimate mediums. So, you know, from Facebook, can you get them or Insta, can you get them to your, to your YouTube channel? Can you from there, get them to your blog? And from there, can you get them onto uh can you give them an opportunity? Can you invite them to go deeper with you and get on your email list so that you can serve them um, whenever you want? Every two weeks is when I do it, seven o'clock in the morning. My audience knows on a, every second Sunday, they're going to get an email from me. And, um, and it, that gives me a way to, uh, it, it is the most productive way that I've found to get their attention and to, cause my, you know, my content's fairly long form. I'm not sending them quick little trivial things about what I ate for breakfast. It's significant ideas. And if you've written a book about a particular subject, then you could be sending your audience every two weeks or every month or whatever feels right to you. You could be sending them a further article or thought or idea or something related to the central idea that you are so impassioned about that, that you would actually take the time and energy to write that book. Mm -hmm. There's got to be things that didn't make the book. There's got to be ideas that are tangential. There's got to be things that since you wrote the book that you've maybe reconsidered or had different thoughts about, you could be sending these as emails, as a service and getting their attention, getting their loyalty, getting them excited, trained, if you want to put it in that term, um, to open your emails. It is so effective. And when it comes to, you know, all of the other stuff out there, we've become, I think, lazy. Oh, I'll just put it up on Facebook. Well, that's well and good. But again, if only three to six or 7% of your audience is even going to see it, 
uh, and let alone, you know, in the context of, I mean, when do people go to Facebook? They're just distracted. They're just bored. They're just scrolling through. So in my mind, it's just ineffective. And anyway, so that's, that's the course, but it's not off on offer right now, but every, uh, two weeks on, I think I send it out on Wednesday. I have an email called the audience Academy and it's a free article about putting your work into it's for creative people it's about putting your work into the world for an audience uh and the kind of priorities that i think we need to embrace if we're going to do this with integrity and and um in ways that are authentic to us uh so the audience academy you can get it at the audienceacademy.com uh, that's all just one url the audienceacademy.com um and at the same time there's a there's a pdf there that i will send you it's called encore three ways to stop marketing and start um, and now I've forgotten the subtitle and start um, building an audience that wants more something to that effect. And that's, that's really key for me is this idea that your work will find its own audience. And if they love it, they will want more. And your only job then is to give that to them. And sometimes it'll be free. And other times they'll have to spend 20 bucks, uh, bucks on a book or a hundred dollars on a course or, or whatever. But it's all about finding that group of people that love what you do, want more of it, find value in it, and just giving. And again, it comes all the way back to that idea of what's the gift? What is the thing that you're giving and putting out into the world? And then just being, I love, I love that we came to that idea of stewardship, because then that's what your job is, is to steward that gift every week, every couple of weeks, faithfully, consistently. And it's quite amazing. I've, you know, I've grown my email list over the years to almost 100,000 photographers and creative people. And um, I make a very good living sitting down every, I mean, I write every day and asking myself, what can I give to these people? What can I give that I have learned, that I've experienced? What can I give them? And yes, sometimes that, that part of that gift is an invitation to go even deeper and then there's a, quite frankly, a, I mean, I get a lot of emails from my audience saying, David, when it, when it comes to your stuff, you're in the shut up and take my money category because they know that there's going to be, even though they put 20 bucks down, they're going to get much more value out of it than that. What's to feel bad about, right? When exactly. you know that you're making the world a better place and people are, and that's the beautiful thing. If you built into your emails a way for people to respond if you've built in a way so that you can build some community and, and talk to them, you start getting emails that, I mean, when's the last time, folks, if you're listening, when's the last time people sent you an email and thanked you for marketing to them? <laughs> well, it can happen. It, oh, yeah, it really absolutely. Yeah, I've got many we, the same. We get, I mean, I get so many emails that, you know, I, I can't deal with them all. My wife takes care of support around here. And the um, number of people that just want to say thank you for my emails is astonishing. So I, I say that to, to let you know, it can be done beautifully. It can be done in such a way that it is a gift and that people respond to it. And you can go to bed at night, not feeling like, you know, you have to take a shower first because you've been marketing all day, but you've been putting these gifts into the world and that people, not everyone wants it. I mean, you, you, our work will only ever uh, draw a, quite a small crowd, uh, relatively speaking. I mean, even even the best Michael Jackson hit at the height of his career uh, only hit a very small percentage of the world's population. So we can be content with these small audiences that we're serving and nourishing and know that at the end of the day, we did something for them. And I think that's that itself is a gift. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, David, um, thank you for all the gifts that you've given uh, to oh, your community and, and, and the rest of us. Um, you know, I, I think it's just such a helpful mindset and, uh, you know, it's just such a great example of the way marketing should be done. And I wanted to make sure that I got you in front of uh, our audience so they could learn from thank what you. you're doing. Thank you. Well, that, that is a gift in itself. And uh, I would love to do this again with you sometime. Well, we will. All right. Thanks so much, David. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian.